Welcome to Animal Rights, the Abolitionist Approach Commentary. I'm Gary Francione. This is our 17th, no frills, no bells, no whistles, commentary concerning the abolition as opposed to the regulation of animal exploitation, ethical veganism as the moral baseline of the animal rights movement, and the principle of ahimsa, or nonviolence, and its role in all of our advocacy efforts. In this, our 17th commentary, we're going to have a discussion involving three of us. I will be joined by Ronnie Lee, who in 1972 founded the Band of Mercy, and in 1976 the Animal Liberation Front, and is considered to be the founder of uh, the the direct action wing of the animal rights movement, and uh, and he's he's paid a price for that. In 1975, he was sentenced to three years in prison. In 1977, he was sentenced to 12 months, and in 1987, to 10 years. 1987, uh, our third guest, Dr. Roger Yates, was also sentenced to four years imprisonment. Uh, Dr. Yates is now a sociologist, and he teaches at University College in Dublin and at the University of Wales in Bangor. Uh, and is really, uh, in in my judgment, um, uh, leading the, the the leading sociologist of the movement in terms of uh, both his historical perspective and his really uh, deep deep understanding of the uh, of the sociology of the movement. Uh, and in in many ways, um, only someone with his background could could uh, could bring the uh, the perspective that he brings to his uh, academic work, which is uniformly of high quality. But anyway, welcome Ronnie, welcome Roger, and thank you for joining the uh, the commentary today. Are you both there? Yes, yep. I'm, yep, I'm here. Okay, very good, very good. <laughs> Hi, very Gary. Good. Hi. Um, we are uh, we're going to cover several topics, and we're going to try to keep focused on these topics so that um, so that we don't stray too terribly much. And we're also thinking about this as the first of of uh, one of several podcasts that we'll do. So we will probably not cover everything uh, in this podcast. And uh, I suspect that all of us will be getting feedback of uh, different sorts from people uh, about this podcast. And so perhaps in future podcasts, we can address not only other topics, but we can uh, we can address some of the questions that I'm sure that we are going to get as a result of this one. But in any event, let me start off by saying uh, it is a um, it is a tenet of the abolitionist approach, at least as I have developed it uh, over over the past years, um, that uh, that it's nonviolent. As a matter of fact, I I, um, I say uh, frequently I am violently opposed to violence uh, for both uh, moral and doctrinal reasons. I mean, I I see the animal rights movement as the extension of the peace movement. I see I see the efforts to uh, end animal exploitation uh, as 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 part of the peace movement and I see I see what we're trying to do or at least what some of us are trying to do as an extension of the peace movement and perhaps a revitalization of the peace movement and as a practical matter I have uh, I, I don't see the point of it uh, it seems to me that as long as people are demanding uh, animal products it doesn't really matter whether you shut down slaughterhouses or or biological or biomedical supply houses if the demand is there the supply will be met and so we really do have to work on educating people and getting the demand to go away uh, because focusing on the institutional users is like animal welfare reform uh, a focus uh, at the wrong place and um, so I, I have a very strong position on that both doctrinally and practically and uh, and and I've invited Ronnie and, and Roger to uh, talk about this issue amongst others that we're going to to, to, to get to today uh, because I I think um, uh, both of their positions are are um, uh, are subtle and uh, often misunderstood and I think that it would be great to hear. Uh, I don't is 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 from the horse's mouth a speciesist expression? Uh, should we? I don't know whether we should stop and consult Joan Denayer and ask her whether or not this is a speciesist expression. <laughs> and if it is, I apologize, Joan. Um, but uh, that we should hear it from the horse's mouth as to whether or not you know what 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 your views are on this topic. And let me say let me say this: this is a hypothetical. Discussion in the sense that um, uh, we are having uh, a discussion, 
and no one is advocating violence and um, and uh, and I want to make that clear that uh, we are talking about uh, uh, matters that are currently of 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 moment in the movement that are currently being discussed by a lot of people uh, but I want to make it clear that um, that that uh, the position any position that you hear to hear here today is um, is is one of, uh, of of a discussion and no one is encouraging anyone to engage in any illegal or violent conduct with that uh, notion in mind what do you all think about violence? I mean, you know what I think, and and uh, that's pretty much on the table. What's what are your views, and and uh, and explain them to us, Ronnie? Why don't you start, and we can go to Roger, or Roger, you can start. I don't really care. Well, I think the um, first of all, the um, the focus of of the movement has has to be <clears throat> really overwhelmingly nonviolent because it has to be on education. Um, it is very important to educate people um, not to support animal abuse in their lives. In other words, to be vegan, um, not to, say, go to places like zoos and circuses, not to go to horse racing or bet on it, uh, not to wear fur, all, 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 all those things. That's, that's very important, and, and that educational process really has to be um, non-violent. But I think it's um, a lot depends on on what the definition of violence is, because if we go on to say we have to have laws to uh, prevent animal abuse, we have to have laws against vivisection, we have to have laws. Hopefully, one day there'd be laws against um, against uh, using and, and killing animals for food. Um, if we're going to have those laws, ultimately those laws would need to be enforced, literally enforced, by the use of force by, by the state. Now, is that not in itself a form of violence? You see, because it, it's really my view that if, if someone um, is going to be truly non-violent, that person really has to be an anarchist. Now, I'm not, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not an anarchist. I, I was at one time. I, I'm, I'm not, I haven't been for a long time. Um, but in, 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 in my view, that to be totally non-violent, you'd have to be an anarchist because uh, you would have to also reject the violence of the state as well as the violence of the individual. So I think before we talk about violence, we, we really have to define what we mean by it. Um, now, as far as the, the violence of the individual is concerned, um, my concern in this, uh, my concern about a, a, a totally non-violent approach is that the um, the people we're up against, the animal abusers, um, they're no respecters of non-violence. Somebody that can hunt and chase and shoot or, or watch an animal, small animal t torn apart, um, they're, they're no respecter of the non-violence of that creature. It could be nothing less violent than a, a rabbit or, 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 a, or that's being hunted or a guinea pig in the laboratory that's been experimented on. And those people that, that do those horrific things to those creatures are no respecters of the non-violence of those creatures. Uh, and it's rather like a bully, that, that really, um, if you're up against the bully, you have to show that bully um, force, yeah, that there has to be a show of force to, to deter that person, to put that person off. And, and my worry is, is, is that by being totally non-violent, we actually allow these people to get away with abusing animals. And, and that in itself cannot, cannot be a moral position. So that's my, that's my feeling about it, although um, I'd advocate um, overwhelming non-violence in, in what we do because it's educational. I'm not totally opposed to the use of force, the use of violence in certain circumstances. <clears throat> well, I, I have a lot to, you've made a lot of points and I'd like to respond to them, but first I'd like to uh, hear from Roger in terms of his, uh, his, his view of the, the general issue about violence. Um, I'd like to um, start off obviously making uh, a couple of sociological points uh, about that. Uh, Ronnie has talked about uh, violence as an issue and about force uh, as an issue. And it is true, of course, that society, from a sociological point of view, is full of force all the time. And so there is elements of force which we will all agree with. For example, we agree with the force of argument. 
and uh, you know, in in some senses, Gary, that's 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 your main uh, mo, if you like, uh, that that you believe in the force of, of argument to be able to convince people of of your position. The nonviolent <laughs> force of argument. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, but <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not quite sure if there is a violent force of argument. But there you go. Uh, but you know, uh, again, you know, from a sociological point of view, really, what what you know, the actual norms and values of society, the the um, mores that people are born into are, are an element of force as well because they, they kind of constrain people's behavior. It's the, the lens through which, uh, you know, pe- people, uh, their attitudes are, are formed and people are judged uh, on the existing uh, norms and values of society. So there's elements of force all the time. And again, sociologically, most people's behavior is not controlled actually by laws it's controlled by other people in terms of their interaction. Uh, you know, by even people just making comments to you, by people giving you a funny look, they tell you, they tell you, um, you know, that you're doing wrong. This is this is how how we we interact on a kind of social animal level, if you like. So force is with us all the time. But then you've got the force of law, which, uh, as as Ronnie said, you know, is is often violent. Um, and then you know i've always i've always accepted that um the force of argument is the most important thing in the sense that that would bring about cultural change but i've always um accepted that there's going to be some people uh, and maybe the ones that Ronnie alluded to you know the, the ones who get a kick out of blood sports or whatever who who will ne- never kind of change in a voluntary sense and we could never kind of win them over in terms of, of an argument so there's got to be an element of force about against them either by you know just making it impossible for them to do what they want want to do or actually make, making it illegal then there's the issue of violence and um you know as as you said there there are, there are kind of moral elements to this and practical elements um my take on 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 violence is that um i've always been opposed to it uh but not uh, totally certainly not in terms of self defense um but also on a, t- on a tactical level, um, I've always seen that there's a, there's a big issue between whether um, the people who take direct action are interested in in what society thinks about what they do and what, by implication, the rest of the movement thinks about what they do or not. And I think we went through a period in the, in the 1980s where, this, where we started to kind of flip and flop about a little bit on, on this, at least certainly on a personal level, I did, uh, where I, uh, there was a, a time when I thought that direct action could become a mass movement and that effectively direct action could do it on its own. And so, therefore, it, it kind of gave you more leeway to do to do what you wanted to do because you didn't have to think about what society uh, would make of, of what you do. I, I now see that that that, that was a, a naive view. And so, therefore, um, if you're going to take society into account because it's society's norms and values that you're trying to change, and so that means that you're trying to change the culture which is species it, you, you, you then have to take into account the existing kind of speciesism in terms of attitudes. Uh, and so that means that you're very limited in terms of what you can do. And so in terms of what's going on at the moment in the movement, I'm very worried about these these ideas that are floating around in, on the Internet at the moment, which, which are the notion that we should do everything by any means necessary um, and also incorporate that into notions of vegan education and incorporate that into notions of alliance politics. I just don't see how those things can work as a recipe whatsoever. It seems to me that if you're interested in alliance politics, if you're interested in, in education, then that means that there's a heck of a lot of things in, in the direct action terms that you can't do. And what, one of the things you can't do is is, is be violent. And so, in fact, I, I, I would say that direct action really should be generally speaking, limited to um, rescue, either in a kind of open rescue sense or a closed uh, um, rescue sense. So, so that's my kind of opening gambit on all of that. Well, we can. Uh, you both have raised a lot of interesting um, issues, and and um, let me let me comment on it, make a couple of comments. Uh, but I'm not going to address everything because I think these things will will um, work their way into our conversation as we go. F- 
go forward. But um, the idea that the law is violent, um, as a law professor and as somebody who teaches criminal law, I appreciate what Ronnie and you say about the notion that the law is inherently coercive. You know, I mean, it's not just the law. And Roger, as you point out, it's not just the law which is coercive, but social norms can be coercive. Yeah, um, quite. You know, I mean, if one behaves in a certain way, one the, the social reaction that one gets um, m might be itself coercive. Um, but, uh, but when we're talking about the coercion of the state, as Ronnie was referring to when he talks about uh, law, um, it st strikes me as something peculiar about saying, well, um, we don't want to have violence to children. We don't. We, we think that violence toward children, you know, pedophilia is a bad idea, and it has, you know, for for lots and lots of different reasons. Um, you know, it's horribly destructive and harmful to children, uh, and and uh, so we want to stop it, and and so we imprison people. Um, you know, are we using violence uh, as a response to violence? Are we being violent? Um, and and there there is it seems to me a sense in which well you know y yes any sort of coercion um, is is could be said to represent violence but it seems to me that there is such a um, a difference when we are talking about the violence of pedophilia and then the violence or the coercion of confinement that we're talking about something which is not quantitatively different but qualitatively different now i i think an important footnote to that is one has to look at one's uh, penal philosophy uh, in the United States, for example, most prisons are run by uh, private corporations, and uh, the notion of rehabilitation uh, is 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 uh, is is really not um, uh, an, an idea that has much currency in the um, the modern American penal system. Um, and um, you know it really is retribution, punishment, making the situation really unpleasant. Uh, it really, it really is imposing harm for harm's sake. Um, and 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 I I think it's sort of interesting because I've been watching uh, the uh, election that you're having presently having in Britain, the election campaign that you're presently having in Britain right now, and how interesting and different the discourse is. I don't really know whether there's any practical effect to it or not a practical difference, but your politicians, or at least some of them, are talking about the importance of the prison system being rehabilitative, that it, it shouldn't be a system where uh, we impose harm for harm's sake, or it's like you did something wrong, so now we're going to, you know, we're going to get you, we're going to harm you, we're going to hurt you, but rather that you've engaged in some behavior that we regard as antisocial, and we want to get you to see that that's antisocial, we want to rehabilitate you, and the discourse, it's uh, that that actually, in and and again, I'm perfectly willing to acknowledge and accept if you tell me that that's just all claptrap and it's really there's really nothing behind it and it's just politicians talking. But the I but but at least your politicians are using the R word rehabilitation. Our politicians don't. We tend to have a very sort of mean spirited and and uh, and I think uh, perhaps violent attitude toward what. Uh, incarceration is or, or the enforcement or what the enforcement of the criminal law is so I think that there's a difference but I also think that there's a qualitative difference between for example the harm of pedophilia and and the coercion that results either the organized coercion of the state in terms of enforcing laws against pedophilia or the social approbation that occurs because most people think it's a horrifying thing uh, another point I wanted to make and then then we can we can we can go on um, is when when Ronnie mentioned, he said, "Well, you know, part of the the problem with having an exclusively nonviolent approach is that uh, there are people who do violence, and 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 uh, you know, there are people who go hunting, and there are people who do vivisection, and there are people who do these things, and and um, and yes, I I agree with that, and I think it's all horrible, but." What about, you know, I mean, again, I, the problem I have with that is it, it, it seems to me somewhat artificial that we're looking at certain people as exploiters and certain people as, um, as, 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 as being violent, uh, the violent exploiters, when in fact, um, you know, in the criminal law, for example, if you get angry, uh, and this is true of uh, of uh, law here. I mean, it's the common law, so it's true of uh, of Britain as well. But 
uh, if you get angry and you you kill somebody, uh, that homicide uh, will often be classified as a, as manslaughter, uh, which is not the highest degree of homicide. The highest degree of homicide is premeditated murder, and it will be regarded as manslaughter because uh, of the of the emotional component in, in, in it. Whereas um, a, a perfect example of homicide, which will be considered to be uh, a premeditated deliberate murder is uh, is is if I pay somebody to kill someone else, I very coolly and calmly you know give uh, x uh, some amount of money and say, "Go kill y that 's an example of premeditated deliberate murder, and that 's i mean and that 's going to be punished at the highest level um, you know I, I agree that people shouldn't be hunting or they shouldn't be doing vivisection and, and, and they shouldn't be slaughtering animals and whatnot. But what about everybody? You know, it's like we're drawing this artificial line. It's not they who are the exploiters. Um, it's everybody who's the exploiter because particularly when we're talking about institutional exploiters, they're by and large people who are capitalists they're indifferent they they'll sell bananas if they can sell if they can make more money than selling beef they're they're running slaughterhouses because that's how they make money um, and and um, you know yeah I, I think there's something perverse about going into the woods and enjoying pointing an arrow at a deer and 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 shooting that arrow or shooting that gun I think there's something perverse about enjoying that sort of activity but I also think there's something perverse about the fact that you know we jump in our cars and we go down to the supermarket and and we buy um, you know some dead animal part or some animal product and many times we feel good about it because it has the RSPCA freedom food label or the HSUS uh, certified raised uh, and handled humane uh, uh, label or something like that and so I think that you know when we talk about violence um, I, I think the people who are buying these products are engaging in violence just as the people who are producing them are and in many ways the people who are producing them are acting in response to the demand that we are creating. Ronnie, what do you think of that? Well, I mean, it's, um, would you say, for instance, that um, somebody in this country that voted for a government that agreed with sending troops abroad to fight in a war, all those people that voted for that party were just as guilty as the government itself with, you know, for killing those people in, in those other countries. It's a, that would be a similar analogy, wouldn't it? Well, no, no, not, necessar so, not necessarily. I mean, if I, if I vote for a government which does things that I don't approve of, um, that's, that, I mean, I, I would say, I would say that somebody who, who, um, who casts a vote for a party which is known uh, for having a racist tent, you know, for having a racist platform or uh, of some sort? Th then I would say that, well, yes, if you vote for a party that has a racist platform, then you have moral complicity in in. I mean, uh, do you have the same level of moral complicity as the doer? The answer is. Is is no because that because because that that person is making an independent decision to engage in conduct which you have in a sense enabled. But I I, I do I I don't see that R Ronnie and I'd be curious to know what Roger thinks. I don't see that as analogous to the person who goes to the store and buys the dead animal. There's a real direct connection there, much more analogous to the person who pays somebody to go and do the killing. Roger, what do you think of that? Roger, Roger, as a sociologist, what do you think of it? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think I think uh, um, I, would, I would agree with that in the sense that I think there's a, a much more direct uh, thing there. But of course, you know, as, as we probably all know, the ideology of animal welfareism comes in there to f fog the issue. You know, because the promise of, of um, animal welfareism is for non-cruel use, and so when people do go to the to the store. Uh, they they believe that uh, well okay no they they've heard the stories about um, the cruelty and they've they've heard the stories that there are some problems but you know that's not going to be the pro they're they're buying so in some senses animal welfareism uh, acts as a mystifier uh, in that 
And in fact, e- even even going going back to the, the 1970s with uh, Peter Singer's um, Animal Liberation, he he put he, he put a, a strong kind of sociological finger on things when, when he said that the the very existence of traditional welfare groups like the HSUS and the RSPCA uh, in Britain. Um, up to that mystification, because the very existence of those groups that are there to stamp out cruelty means that there is no cruelty in in the product that uh, that someone picks up off the shelf, because it, it this product can't be cruel because the RSPCA exists, you know. So I I, th- I think that in actual fact that that from both sides of this it's a little bit more complicated uh, in, in actual fact, and culpability is is, is difficult there in terms of, um, you know, I think, uh, Gary, you, uh, at the moment, you're, you're arguing that, that people are pretty much uh, aware of the kind of torture or the conditions or the, uh, you, you know, the, they're aware that when they pick up, a, 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 you know, a piece of meat or an animal product or, a, you know, a, a bottle of milk from the shelf, they're pretty much aware of what it is and what that kind of stands for. And I, I don't actually think that that's completely true. Uh, I think I think that the ideology of animal welfare mystifies that and uh, kind of you know put, puts that out of focus. And the premise of, of animal welfareism as non-cruel use, and, and, you know, kind of convinces people that well, this what I've got now in my hand right now is it, you know is one of these non-cruel items. Well, um, well, uh, well, Ronnie, what, what, what do you think? I'll, I'll respond to that in a second. Ronnie, I'd like to hear what you think. I think I think there's something else going on as well, which is kind of. Um, Perhaps beyond the, uh, the the animal welfare issue, and and, and that's the um, the idea of habit that um, that that all animals are, are tremendously creatures of habit, uh, uh, and and that includes human beings. And it, it can. I remember I used to get so frustrated because um, how I became a, a vegetarian and. Um, eventually a vegan was um I, I knew somebody it was actually my sister's um ex-husband uh, he was a vegetarian he was also a very good athlete very fit guy it made me i was a big meat eater at the time it made me think about it um never thought about vegetarianism uh, before and within three or four days of meeting him i decided to be a vegetarian i i could not i lay awake at night trying to justify eating meat and I couldn't, and I became a vegetarian. And so it always frustrated me that if I was giving leaflets to people about about vegetarianism, veganism, um, why those people didn't just read that and then become um, a vegetarian um, or a vegan like I did? Why was it that it was something that, that I did very quickly and yet other people could see all that and yet they didn't change? Um, but now I think I maybe understand it a bit a bit more, and, and that is that people are so um, are so much victims of habit that even that, that if people are in the habit of living a certain way, if they're in a habit of of um, consuming animal products, that that is such a powerful force. That's such a powerful force that it's it's something that's very very difficult to overcome. Uh, and, and I think that's. To, to, to me now, um, I, I I don't get so frustrated about how difficult it is to somehow um, to, to to educate everybody Be, because I understand because I understand that. I mean, you get people that are you know very nice people in lots of ways, but to try to get them to give up animal products is so difficult. Even when you present them with with with, with, the, with the, the whole picture, there's something there blocking that, and I think it's this force of habit that's so powerful. Yeah, there's also an element of safety in numbers. And in fact, you know, what, what you're saying there, and in fact, you know, what we said all, all along, is kind of summed up in a kind of quintessential sociological phrase, which is that we are free and unfree all at the same time. You know, and, and that, that is a kind of social reality. You know, we, we, do, we do have society bearing down on us. And at the same time, we, we do have some elements of freedom to move within, within those... Uh, you know the structures that society creates. Uh, you know, and so we, we we can kind of, if you like, get the freedom to, you know, gain some information, and that might have an impact on us. And then it's almost like a question of, well, what do we do next? Uh, you know, and then you know your mates come along and say, hey, we're, we're off down to McDonald's. Are, are you coming? 
and th- and then you know you you move you kind of move on in in, in a sense, um, you know, and uh, of, of course there's no there's no there's no real um, emphasis either within within society in general and also within the animal advocacy movement uh, for consistency. In fact, it's interesting really that um, if if you if somebody comes along who is consistent in their views, they, they usually dismiss as a fanatic or an extremist or something, which is quite, you know, quite an interesting phenomenon, really. Um, so are, you kid- a- are you kidding? Does that really happen? <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, but, you know, but, but going back to the person then, because there's no kind of expectation of consistency, in, in, in fact, I was, I was talking to a friend the other day, and uh, you know, he just had guests over from, from Europe for a music festival, and uh, when they found out he was vegan, he explained all that. You know, he, he didn't kind of push it down their throat. He, he just kind of talked to them, and they were very receptive. And then, as soon as soon as they said, "Oh, that's really kind of interesting," then they they kind of said to, to themselves, "Well, now let's go for a meal. Where do we go?" And and they go they go they go and eat meat. They they don't connect the two the two things. You know, there's a disconnect there. And I think we've got a, a lot of that. And also, there's another element which I covered in my PhD. Uh, a whole kind of literature, really, about denial, which is a very strong social psychological issue, and, and you know, human beings um, are very good at denial, and that's also got to be f- factored into this. You know, in in, in terms of, you know, we we're thinking of social movements about how to bring about social change. You know, human beings and the societies that they create are, are, are very complex, but they're also not consistent. Uh, you know, in terms of their values or, or whatever, you know, every, everybody gives lip, lip service to the notion of human rights, you know, and 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 yet, you know, thirty thousand children die of starvation every day. You know, there's there's no consistency uh, in society or within individuals either. Well, I think you know that um, a good a good part of the explanation of the inconsistent behavior. Can be traced back, you know, 200 years and um, and and right up to the present time in the in the writing of uh, Peter Singer and in the position that most of these animal organizations take. This is the distinction that I draw between treatment and use. That you know the 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 welfare movement focuses primarily on treatment and says that well you know the 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 difficulty or the problem or the primary problem or perhaps the exclusive problem is suffering and uh, we we need to do what we can to eliminate that or reduce that and and the distinction between that position and the position uh that we have no moral justification for using them however uh uh humanely uh, we may treat them now i i maintain that because they're chattel property we are never going to protect their interests to any significant degree because um, uh, uh, protecting interests uh, imposes an economic cost and as a general matter and, and historically uh, we have we have only protected animal interests when we get an economic benefit from 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 doing so but my argument is is that we can't justify the use of animals irrespective of how humanely we may treat them. Now, I think part of the problem is that uh, whatever Singer was saying about uh, how these humane societies present or, or, or facilitate or promote the illusion that animal, animals are being used in a humane way, the, 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 the bottom line is that um, people overwhelmingly still think that animal use is okay. They're un- and I th- see, my, my, my perception is that most people, or many people at least, are uncomfortable about animal use, but they don't really think that animal use per se is a problem. They think that the, the challenge is to raise the animal in an appropriate way or to produce the product in, an, in a morally appropriate way. And this notion is reinforced by people like Singer, uh, who do regard people like me as fanatical, um, and, and, um, and, and uh, 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 groups like PETA and groups like even like Vegan Outreach and these, these ostensibly vegan organizations basically take the position that, well, we ought to be reducing suffering and, you know, 
Now we can reduce suffering in a variety of ways by being vegan or by eating cage-free eggs or by eating freedom food or by eating you know other happy meat or other happy uh, happy animal products. So I think that a lot of it has to do with the success of the welfare movement and the new welfarist movement of convincing people that the problem is really not use it's it's treatment. Having said all that, I still don't think that you know again I, I'm I'm not saying that. Um, that uh, uh, um, we ought to make moral judgments about the about personal moral judgments about people who consume animal products. I'm not really interested in making moral judgments about individuals. What I am interested, uh, though, is in making the point that um, animal exploitation exists because we want it to exist. Um, the the most numerically significant use of animals is for food, and the reason why that exists is because people want to consume those products. And as long as that's the case, there are going to be suppliers of those products. Uh, similarly with vivisection. Um, you know, I, I've been in a university now teaching for almost 30 years. I know a lot of vivisectors and, and I think it's, it's um, you know, do I think some of those people are just sadistic people uh, who, who get some sort of um, pleasure out of doing what they do? And the answer is yes, unfortunately, I've met some of them. I've also met a large number of people who do animal research who are very troubled by it, who believe that they're doing something useful um, and who believe that they're doing something essential, actually. Some, I mean, uh, 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 many of the people I know who do vivisection uh, really do believe that they're doing something essential um, and necessary and important. Um, and and uh, and they are troubled morally by what they do. So I think it's 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 stereo. You know, it's it's too much of a of an easy stereotype to say that they're all you know they're all sadistic people and they're all sort of sitting around rubbing their hands saying how can I torment uh, this animal or that animal? Are there such people? Have I met such people? Absolutely, and it's disturbing. I do know such people, and and it's disturbing to be in their presence. I can assure you. But um, but I also know uh, a lot of vivisectors who don't fit that 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 mold. Do I think what they're doing is wrong? Absolutely. Um, uh, but remember, we're living in a society where uh, people want to live forever. They want magic pills. They want to be able to uh, not exercise or not eat well or wisely. Uh, and they want the magic pill and people support vivisection. And um, and I, I, I mean, you, you look at Britain, for example, which, which, uh, uh, you know, where, where, where the use of animals has has gone up uh, dramatically uh, uh, in the past several years. And um, you know, is there opposition to vivisection? Yes, but it's certainly not in any way, um, you know, getting to the point where people want to elect politicians that are are going to um, are going to, to to stop vivisection or ban vivisection. So I do think we really do need to sort of focus on. We we need to stop creating this artificial divide between them and us. That there are animal exploiters, and then there are those of us who are fighting animal exploitation. Um, for the most part, as far as I'm concerned, those of us who aren't vegan are animal exploiters and I find it curious I don't know what your situation is over in Britain but a number of the people here in the United States who are promoting uh, uh, various forms of violence are not themselves vegan and and um, and I think it's it's uh, it's troubling when someone is not I mean I, I I reject violence under any circumstance but I think it's really it's 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 uh, paradoxical that someone can say I am opposed to violence uh, but uh, you know and I I'm willing to don my balaclava and go and liberate animals, but first let me have a piece of cheese pizza. That I find really um, paradoxical. In addition to, to to troubling. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I think I think that's right, but I, th I think there's di there's kind of different d degrees. But I think it's, it is a complex issue here. For example, um, I do I do agree with the, the general point uh, and the general point that you've been making for a while, Gary, which which is it's difficult to. To make this distinction between um, uh, you know the, the exploiter and, and then the exploiters are, are, are less so, I think Ronnie's answer to that, with, with obviously he, he can come back to uh, on his own, obviously, is is in relation to degrees of innocence. I think I think that's that's his answer to that. But also in terms of what you said about the very sector, I think that's also true, which again adds a complexity. In fact, you know, you were you were saying that you've met some. The sections were probably pretty cat cows, cold kind of people, but others who were who were kind of pretty 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 caring. And in fact, I well, I, I, didn't, I didn't say I didn't I didn't I didn't say necessarily very caring. I I, I I've met 
Well, consider it maybe. Yeah. Did you, well, did you I would say, I would I would say the, the 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 expression I would use is I've met a number of them who are deeply troubled by what they're doing. They're morally uh, they're morally agitated by it. Yeah, they well, I, I, they... met, I met one of those the, the, the other week. I, I did a radio interview in, in Ireland about two weeks ago, and there, there was representatives of the Green Party. There was, there was uh, a couple of um, hunters, and there was me, and uh, I was like the, the, the token vegan extremist on the panel. And then there, there was a vivisector from Trinity College, and uh, he was a fairly kind of reasonable guy. He was tr- troubled uh, uh, about it. He, he was... Uh, he was a, a, a big fan of the kind of three R's type, 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 type notion. But yes. also, in terms of his social situation from a sociological point of view, you know, the, the way I, I didn't see this guy as evil, but I just saw him as deeply socialized. Not only was he socialized as a general matter, like all of us were and or are, to, in, in, a, in, a, in a deeply speciesist society, you know, a society which is saturated in the norms and values of speciesism. But it also, he's then subjected to the specialist socialization, which you alluded to, which, which is the fact that, you know, this is for the benefit of humanity, this is, this is essential stuff, you know, th- this is going to save children, and this kind of stuff, you know. And so, you know, to, to kind of dismiss all that as just, being somebody who's, who's evil and an exploiter, it, you know, it, it's quite kind of, you know, almost kind of crass and, and uh, you know, mean-spirited in, in a way without any understanding of the, of the wider kind of social thing. But then going back to, uh, to, to the general consumer of, of the products, uh, you know, I do think there's probably a distinction to make, and I think Ronnie would make, make this, you know, uh, more stark than me, between the producer and the consumer. Of, of 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 an animal product, Ronnie, um, are you there? Uh, yeah, yes. I mean, I would uh, make that distinction, but I think uh, um, one factor I think that perhaps hasn't been talked about too much. Now, this is going back to the you, you know previous mention of of the prison system and and the law is um, the, the force of coercion because one function of the law is 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 to coerce people. I mean, obviously, if people are put in prison, we'd like a system where those people are reformed or re-educated. But, but um, it, it, is, it isn't just, just prison that, that, that forms a penalty for people. There are things like fines, for instance, um, that, that aren't in any way um, aimed at rehabilitation. That, that's a coercive force. If you, if you do something, then this money will be taken from you. Um, it's a kind of uh, or, or else statement, um, and um, that that in itself, that that coalition could be referred to as a as a form of violence because at the end of the day, it is something that's uh, yeah. But we're, but we're but be, running. We're back to where we started from in, in, yes, in yeah. a sense no, no, because, no, but, because but, in, in, but, in social in social sense, you could say that you know the ideological patriarchy is a. Is a a form of co- coercion, yes, but, and, but, but, and that explains why all these people from Peter are quite willing to take their yes, tops off for the animals and everything. But but but, but, but what I'm saying is that that, that, that if say, I mean, and it's a deterrent, isn't it? It's a deterrent. And what I'm saying is 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 that if we accept that it's justifiable to use deterrents, then why is it that it's only the state that's justified in using? force as a form of deterrent what about individuals using uh, you know doing something unpleasant to somebody that carries out animal experimentation so well, it, depend, it, depend, it depends it. it depends what you mean by it depends, depends what you mean by unpleasant i mean first of all uh, i mean if you mean violent um that's one thing if what you mean by uh, it is that um you are going to challenge that person and 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 make your disagreement clear uh, to that person and engage that person as Roger Roger did um, on that radio show. Um, then um, you know I I I'm not I think that that's perfectly fine. I mean I I, I do think though that that the, the 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 problem that we're really not addressing is the fact that the reason why. As a sociological matter, and again, I realize I'm treading into into dangerous territory here, not being a sociologist, but I think that a good part of the problem here is that the animal welfare movement and the modern what call what calls itself the modern animal rights movement, but which is really an, a welfareist movement, has really convinced the average person that the consumption of animals, the use and consumption of animals, is not per se 
a a a uh, a or the moral problem. I mean, when you have people like Singer saying that imposing death isn't the problem, the problem is making the animal suffer. Then what you've done is you've created a class of people who can who can. Um, feel good about themselves by going to the store and buying the freedom food uh, or the cage-free egg or or buying none of those products but just uh, being comforted by the fact of knowing that there are laws that require the humane treatment of animals and things of that nature so so you know it's not that I mean I, I think that we're 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 um, uh, ignoring the fact we're 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 treating the consumer as somebody who is sort of um, a, a mindless automaton who doesn't really know what what's going on and is deluded or whatever. I I think that that there's a there, there's a a story here that's being told by these animal groups and people buy it because it's convenient. That doesn't mean they're not morally culpable. Now what we do in response to that is we educate them and, and we educate them as I advocate I hope uh, in in creative and nonviolent ways but but one of the things that I've seen um, uh, uh, you know in the years that I've been doing this is how incredibly responsive people are when when you really get them focused away from look it doesn't matter whether we give them a few more inches in the battery it doesn't really matter whether you know the 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 animals have pleasant music playing uh, when they go to slaughter or whether they're going to slaughter in a in a hideous factory that's been designed by you know animal rights uh, hero temple grandin or whoever that it's basically why are we killing them at all? Why are we using them at all? What is our moral justification? Why is it that we love and regard as a member of our family, our dog, our cat, our, our bird, or whatever non-human companion that we love, and we stick a fork into an animal that is empirically and morally indistinguishable from the animal who's a member of our family, a, you know, a, a, an animal that we love. However, humanely we treat him or her it just you know and 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 i find people are really quite responsive to that i don't know no, maybe you don't no no i mean i i think um some people are and some people aren't um i i i i think really the quest is to we have to educate as many people as we can but then we also have to deal with the problem of the people that uh, refuse to be educated well, what, Ronnie, uh, Ronnie, you and you and I are going to be, Ronnie. I hope you live many, 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 many happy, healthy years. But the reality is, we're all getting old, um, and and um, the number of people who are out there who can be educated, there are so many of them um, that if 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 you and I and Roger and you know dozens of other people. Um, Focused our efforts on educating those people, will be we could we could keep ourselves occupied for decades. Um, and and you know there are a lot of people out there to be educated. With respect to the people who aren't going who aren't educable, yes, I agree there are people out there who are not educable. But shouldn't we be concerned about the people who are educable? Shouldn't we be concerned about the phenomenon that is going on right now, which I think is very, very troubling, and that is the notion that there are these people out there who really do care, and they care deeply, and what they're being told is this propaganda by PETA and the Humane Society and the Royal Society and Compassion and World Farming and all of these these welfare corporations that, that are moving them away from um, abolition, uh, abolishing animal use in their lives, and moving them towards happy meat, and you know, selling, basically doing what the Catholic Church did in the Middle Ages, and that is sell indulgences. You can do things that are bad, and you can just pay us, you know, write us a check, and and, and we'll make it all better for you. I think that you know, why don't we fo we we've why don't we focus on the people who are educable, and why don't we try to transform? Um, you know the, the the movement, as it were, so that it stops going in this happy meat direction and focuses on abolition. Oh no, I, I mean, I mean, I mean, absolutely, I I, I agree with you. I, th I think the, the the thing I'd say though is that in terms of um, the people that can't be educated, I think we have to accept there are going to be people that uh, 
that refuse to be educated and take that into account as part of our strategy. Um, with regard to these organisations that are um, telling people that it's okay to um, for animals to be killed as long as they're so-called humanely reared, people like the RSPCA, etc., then the, the question is, what do we do about that? I mean, do we get involved with those organisations and try to change them? Um, this is a tactical um, uh, a matter of tactics, isn't it? What's the best way to, to, to deal with those organisations? Um, there was a um, the RSPCA actually um, at one time didn't oppose was not opposed to hunting. They were actually totally happy with hunting. Uh, there was a lot of hunters in, involved in the RSPCA. And there was a, a, a movement, a group called the RSPCA Reform Group, that got in, um, involved with the RSPCA, changed that by electing um, different people onto their council. They actually managed to get rid of the hunters and change the RSPCA's policies. So they were opposed to hunting. So, you know, that, that kind of thing has been done in a small way. But whether that's... Um, whether that would be a kind of justifiable use of resources to, to to kind of do that again in a much bigger way, it's difficult to say. Well, I mean, I, I you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't think I don't. I by the way, don't think that this is restricted to organizations just like the RSPCA or certainly HSUS, which is is um, is, is is every bit the same sort of organization. I think you have organizations like PETA. I mean, for example, they announced a boycott of Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, as long as uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken is not gassing chickens. And then as soon as Kentucky Fried Chicken in Canada agrees to phase in over the next three million years buying its uh, chickens from suppliers who gas chickens, then then PETA calls off the boycott. Well, that sends a very, very strong... And then and, and praises uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken for its concern about animal welfare. Well, what does that do? That sends the message that consuming gassed chickens is a morally acceptable thing to do. So I don't think it's just the, the, the old line organization. I think it's. I think it's the the. I think it's basically all of these org, virtually all of these organizations. But I think you've raised an, uh, uh, a fascinating question that we will now turn to our resident sociologist, Dr. Roger Yates, um, because I think that 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 Roger Ronnie's question: What do you do with when you're confronted with all of these big mega animal welfare corporations? Do you try to get involved and change them, or do you just? Um, you just try to work outside of them and and sort of ignore them and move on. Well, that is a big question, and um, I suppose it also um, uh, goes into what one of Ronnie's current themes, which is you know, do you get involved in in, in politics in some way? Like, for example, do you do you get involved with the Green Party? Uh, uh, that 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 kind of issue. Um, I, I'm not I'm not I'm not quite sure in the sense that. Um, you know, my my attitude towards the HSUS and and uh, and the RSPCA is that I I you know I I don't mind what what they do in a traditional animal welfare sense, which, which, which is the, you know that they 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 res rescue the uh, the abused animals from the backyards and, and you know look 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 after them and uh, prosecute the people who who did it and this kind of thing. Uh, you know, in some senses, the, the one thing that they shouldn't get involved with is kind of campaigning uh, in a way. You know, they they, they seem to be uh, you know, very kind of traditional w w welfare. You know, cats and dogs and all, all all that kind of stuff. And then, then there's a kind of crossover in into uh, animal welfare or progressive animal welfare. And then and then the category will start calling them animal rights, and so it, it causes um, you know a, a, a lot of confusion. I think in terms of uh, of of a strategy for for change, which I I would support, is is not necessarily getting involved with them, which sounds like years and years of, of kind of struggle with you know with with people. Who are kind of entrenched within the welfare ideology? I, I, I would say that the idea would be to create a uh, clear new uh, animal rights mo movement, which which is based on, uh, as you say right at the beginning of your podcast, you know, the notion of veganism as a as a moral baseline and, and all all those kind of kind of issues, which which is a kind of separate idea. I, th I think it's a bit messy when you start to. Uh, to, to get involved, and I say, I say that as somebody who's, who's involved with um, you, you know the fallout, if you like, from the BOV being radicalised, which was a, which was a very good thing uh, in uh, you know for, for grassroots campaigners for for a number of years uh, in Britain. Uh, you know when, when uh, you know people with relatively radical ideas uh, were suddenly uh, found themselves 
uh, you know, with the degree of money which they which they can use for, you know, for things like fly posters and, and uh, local group campaigning and, uh, and everything else. But to actually get involved with the existing cam- campaigns, I- I'm not sure about that at all. Yeah, I, I, I tend I tend to agree with you. I mean, have, some, I mean, if you look at the BUAV now, it's a joke, and and I think that. Um, you know, I was involved when I first got involved, and when I when I first became involved with this issue, um, I was involved with PETA at right right from the very inception in the early 1980s, uh, and and I worked with some of the other groups um, throughout the uh, the 80s and into the 90s, and then by the mid 90s, it became clear to me that these were corporations, these were organizations that. Um, uh, you know, packaged and sold single issue campaigns that they were really never going to uh, make any significant social change. They had a, th- th- there was a built in um, impetus to uh, uh, take very sort of conservative positions. I remember once being being invited by a, a group of leaders of the um, of the animal rights movement to come and talk about my views on the relationship between sexism and speciesism, and I gave this talk, and 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 people looked at me as if I had two heads and said, "Well, you know, this is this is about animals. It has nothing to do with women's rights." And I said, "No, no, it has everything to do with women's rights. It has everything to do with with discrimination against people of color or or sexism." Uh, it's one of the reasons why I I um, not 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 the only reason and um, but but one of the many reasons why I decided to stop volunteering my my time with PETA was because of the sexism and about heterosexism and other forms of things that that I think are 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 uh, are part of the you know they're they're all violent racism sexism heterosexism ableism all of these things are forms of violence I reject them all and I reject speciesism as part of the rejection of violence so so I, I I think these organizations are basically I mean trying to reform them is um, I think by and large a waste of time. I mean, whether one gets involved politically, uh, we don't really have a. a, a, a I mean, we have a Green Party here, but it's not a it's not a viable political force in any sense. Not not in the way it is in Britain. And um, you know, but again, I I look at the positions uh, that are taken by the Green Party, and they may be better than the positions that are taken by New Labour and by the Tories and by the Liberals, Liberal Liberal Democrats. But nevertheless, I'm troubled by it. And I think by, the bottom line is we're never going to really see any significant political change until we have social change, because because political change and legal change generally follow social change. They don't they don't generally lead it. And and until I mean that's one of the reasons why I think the the, the, the primary phase, uh, primary focus ought to be on um, on on um, uh, creative nonviolent vegan education that we do as a grassroots effort, a grassroots uh, uh, activity, and then we build. I mean, if we had taken, just think about this: if we took all the money. Going back to when we when we were young guys, um, if we took all the money and all the energy that went into the move, you know, into all these welfare campaigns, all these single issue campaigns, if we put that into creative, nonviolent vegan education, we would have on both sides of the Atlantic a significant vegan movement, uh, an ethical vegan movement that could um, have political uh, force, that could uh, effect significant legal change in the form of meaningful prohibitions on animal use. The problem is we're trying to do it, you know, from, we're, we're trying to do it by going, by, by focusing on the, the institutional users in one form or another, um, and instead of focusing on grassroots education. So that that's, that's where I would, where I would, I think, uh, 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 draw the dis- draw the distinction, but I want to I want to move in I- it's okay, if it's okay with you both to another topic that's related, and that is what you think of of single issue campaigns, because I think that Ronnie and I have different views about the value of single issue campaigns, and um, I I'm, I'm very negative about them. I don't think Ronnie shares my negativity about them, and I don't know uh, exactly what Roger thinks. So by single issue campaign, I mean things like you know the the campaign to stop stealing or anti bullfighting campaigns. I just came back from Spain and they were talking about bullfighting and and um, or um, uh, you know fox hunting campaigns and things like that. I tend to generally think for a variety of reasons those campaigns are are useless and i'm not sure that ronnie agrees with me ronnie what what are your views on single issue campaigns? well i think I, I think it can't be denied i think if if uh, fox hunting were stopped now it's not now despite the, the law in this country fox hunting actually 
hasn't stopped because it, you know the, the law is really quite weak. Well, the, the, what, where, where the law's really had an impact uh, over here is on uh, organised hair coursing. That's uh, all the big hair coursing events have been you know brought to an end uh, because of it. Now, Ronnie, I, can, Ronnie, can you explain for people who may not know uh, what, what, what hair coursing is? Hair coursing is it, yeah, hair coursing is where basically um, two greyhounds are unleashed to, to chase after a hare. And um, it's supposedly uh, a contest that's marked uh, on, on the movements that the greyhounds make. There's a judge on horseback that, uh, that, that awards points to the greyhounds. Um, but it causes a great deal of suffering to the hare, and quite frequently the hare is caught and torn apart between the two dogs. So it's a horrendously cruel activity. Now, um, as far as... It, um, that goes on in, in various ways. You know, you, you, you get situations where, where guys just take dogs into a field and chase after hares. It's not, it's not done in a big organised way. Uh, the law has enabled some police forces to really crack down on that type of activity, however, and that's been reduced in some areas. And the big hair coursing events where you get, you know, hundreds if not thousands of people attend them and um, they can go on for several days. Uh, like, for instance, the, the, the most well-known and the, the biggest one of all was a, an event called the Waterloo Cup, which was held up near Liverpool every year. That's all. That's all come to an end because they're not they're not able to do that because of the hunting. And that, that's been the, the biggest impact of, of the law against hunting with dogs. It hasn't been on fox hunting. Um, it's, it's been on hair coursing, and, and I think that, that of itself that. that you know, that that is a that is a positive thing. I mean, in terms in, of, of the whole kind of holocaust of you know, animal animal slaughter and, and suffering, it, it it is quite small. But nevertheless, I think we you know it is it, it is um, it is something that I regard as um, as positive. And I think there's there's no harm in people campaigning on um, single issues, providing they kind of don't do that at the expense of vegan campaigning. In other words, if they say that um, this issue is what's important and, you know, veganism is important and it doesn't matter whether or not people are, are vegan, if, if, if that attitude is adopted and, and there are some organisations, I mean, for instance, the League Against Cruel Sports that campaigns against, against hunting, um, they've got that kind of attitude. that They haven't got a, um, an animal liberationist approach to um uh, to, to, to uh, uh, as a whole it's th- their opposition to hunting is is not done from a an, an animal liberationist basis um and th- th- they have they have people there that think it's perfectly okay to, to eat meat for instance i, I think if organizations are, are campaigning are focusing uh on particular issues because although of course veganism is the it, 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 is in, in you could say is the most important because that's that's the largest area of animal persecution. Um, there are other areas in which animals are are, are per- persecuted, which other animals are, are killed, and, and 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 if those things can be brought to an end, then then then, then that's obviously positive. And it would, and, and if people that are campaigning against these these other areas of animal persecution. Um, are doing so from um, uh, a vegan point of view, are doing so as part of a, uh, an overall opposition to all forms of animal persecution, then I think that's fine. Well, you know, the, pro- the problem, though, is I think that um, for the most part, the single-issue campaigns, as they are promoted by the large organizations, uh, the large organizations really do se- segment these things off, and they have um, they have uh, an incentive to do so because they're trying to they they they, they, they want to package the campaign to be a- acceptable to as many people as possible, and so they don't they don't mix it with a, an abolitionist message of saying, well, you know, we're trying to take one brick out of the wall, but we really want the whole wall to come down. They're saying, um, you know, well, let's let's focus on seal hunting or let's focus on, on bullfighting or let's focus on hair coursing. Um, and I think that, um, you know, when you live in a society where, uh, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z as activities are all regarded as acceptable, indeed as normal, uh, to the extent that you go after X, 
you implicitly or explicitly but you certainly implicitly say y and z are morally distinguishable and i think that's been the the problem with you know vegetarianism for example you know you have these vegetarian campaigns and it suggests that there's some sort of difference between meat and 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 uh and and dairy and and other animal products when there really isn't uh, a morally coherent distinction there and this is something i i have a lot of argument with uh, perhaps you don't so much in 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 the uk as i do here um and and that is um uh you know i i I am frequently arguing with with uh, quote animal people end quote who are telling me that I should be promoting vegetarianism or that I shouldn't be saying that veganism is the moral baseline because for a lot of people vegetarianism is the gateway. Well, for a lot of people vegetarianism is a gateway that doesn't lead anywhere. They're vegetarians for a long time. They don't become vegans, and 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 it's presented as something that is itself a morally coherent position when in fact uh, animals used in dairy are kept alive longer. They're treated every bit as badly as animals used for meat and they all end up in the same slaughterhouse anyway so you know I, th I think that we have to be really really careful and I think most of these organizations are not uh, I mean they are portraying these single issue campaigns at the expense of veganism because that's part of their marketing strategy but 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 you know I also want to say though that it is a zero-sum game because you can say well Look, some of these things have actually worked, and we've gotten rid of some forms of animal suffering, or we've gotten, you know, we've we restricted, or you know, gotten rid of some things. And the answer is, yeah, but at at you know, you got to look at 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 the bigger picture in terms of, um, y you know, I've got three hours today and I've got ten dollars to spend uh, and should I spend it on advocating cage-free eggs or should I uh, spend uh, spend that time and, and those resources the labor and the the financial resources on on educating people about eating no eggs and so you can you can always say that well you know um, uh, well I think it is a zero-sum game, and I think at, 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 at this point it seems clear to me that we can do vegan education and without sacrificing anything, because when I talk about ethical veganism, I'm not talking just about diet. I'm talking about eating them, using them, wearing them. So it's really sort of portrayed as, I mean, when I, when I talk about it, uh, ethical veganism, I am really talking about it as... Um, the abolition of animal exploitation in one's life and it means you don't eat them you don't wear them you don't use them you don't go to circuses you don't go to rodeos you don't pay, patronize uh hair coursing you don't you know it's all part of um you know the notion that animals are 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 non-human moral persons and that we can't justify exploiting them in, in that way and i i think it's very very dangerous you know we we focus on on the seal hunt for example we've just finished uh, uh, another another go round with that as if there's a difference between uh, seal, seal fur and the fur of other animals, or as if there's a difference between wool and fur, and or leather and fur. Well, and, I think the, I, the difference, uh, the difference that uh, it is perceived by the groups that get involved with these camp campaigns. You know, you you, you said that they often don't uh, have an abolitionist message is because is because they they believe the abolitionist message is is too much for people, and so what they're searching for is um the winnable and the doable and there there is a a kind of there is a kind of you know you know you can understand it on a kind of psychological level uh, in in a sense and uh, i remember when i came into the to the movement um the late uh, uh, 1970s you know you know you, we we had this kind of checklist in in our minds well you know Blood sports will be first, and then fur coats will be second, and circus and this kind of stuff. And then you get down to the tricky stuff, which is, which is the meat eating. And of course, the real tricky stuff, uh, from an abolitionist point of view, it, uh, and the bits that, that maybe where the counter movements might uh, might focus on, but also where where people might even the, who are supportive might think, wait, wait a minute, you know, what what about pets? What about insects? And, and this kind of thing. There, in other words, there are some kind of areas which people don't want to. They don't want to go, uh, you know, because they they feel that they can't get any support for, and and so they feel more comfortable as advocates by limiting themselves to a single issue, because that that then they can say, well, look, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this, and and they they then can kind of limit 
um, the issue. And I think part of it is the fact that they, they don't feel comfortable as advocates themselves in in um, in kind of giving the full um, message, if, if you like. You know, I, I think there are, there are a lot of people who, who either are or feel like they, they need to be politicians in the movement. And so therefore, you know, they, they've got to try and make our message palatable. And, and, and that means you know, in, in this deeply species society that, you know, you, you, you can't immediately start talking about pets and all that. You've got, you've got to kind of, you know, kind of let people in gently uh, in, into what we actually stand for. I mean, I, I, re- I reject that because, um, you know, I've, I've got a problem with, with, with single issue uh, campaigning as, as such. But of course, the real issue, and we've all talked about it, is the issue of contextualizing. If, if, if a single issue event like a demonstration is contextualized within an overall vegan uh, issue like R- Ronnie said m- most things in Britain usually are in a grassroots sense uh, you, you know so we don't, they're not talking I mean not, you know there's going to be nobody in, in Britain as far as I know uh, who's going to go out to, to a university trying to get them to to, 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 uh, to switch to cage free um, eggs but you know they, they might go out and do a circus demo and they might stand outside a fur shop you know that that's a kind of different type of thing, and and they themselves would see would see that as just part of a vegan campaign. It's just that at the moment they're focusing on on one thing. And it's a little bit like in in media studies where where you where you realise that the media have got like a hook, you know, we, we, we you know to hang a story on. Well, it's almost like well, you know, we're just using circus as as a, as a hook today, and tomorrow we'll be outside the fur shop. And in that sense, it's single issue, but it's not, it, you know. It's it's the organisations of single issue which I think are different from people who do, you know, single issue events it is a different matter. But the proof the proof is sort of in the vegan pudding, though. I mean, we we the three of us have been in for as long as the three of us have been involved in this issue. Uh, there's been an anti-fur campaign, and um, and yes, fur is being hit by the current recession. But before the current recession, fur had never b- really been stronger, and and um, you know it, it's it, it seems as though the single issue campaigns don't really get anywhere because they really aren't changing fundamental ways of thinking. Um, and also, I mean, I think there are other issues. I mean, I think the fur campaign. Uh, I've always uh, objected to it because I think it has sexist overtones to it as well. And, and sexist implications, but I mean, I don't think the I don't think the the the, the single issue campaigns work. I mean, it, it, you know, t- I just got back from Spain where they're talking about uh, uh, whether or not Catalonia is going to uh, ban bullfighting, and. Um, and 20 years ago, uh, when I went to Spain for the first time, they were having a debate about whether Catalonia was going to ban bullfighting. And, um, you know, and, and I think that, uh, and, 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 and one of the things, the interesting things that's happening now is that Spain is considering a national law that's going to declare uh, bullfighting to be some sort of national heritage and things, and then that will make it much, you know, so, so there's, a, there's a, the re- a reaction against it and whatnot. And so it seems to me that, uh, that, that, that um, really, as long as we don't really look at the um, as long as we're trying to be politicians and as long as we're not really confronting the 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 the, the, the tough issues and we're not, we're not really sort of presenting the tough issues I, I'm not sure we're going to have much success in changing people yeah well you see the thing is you know Gary that that makes sense to you and it makes sense to me but you know in in some ways what you what you what you're kind of saying is that you know we we should pr- present the in- the entire package, if you, if you like to people and say, look, you know, this is consistent, it, you know, it, it's, it's based on, on a good principle and we can make sense, sense of it. But, you know, to, to, to some people, it's almost like saying, well, look, you, you know, we can't convince people to be against one thing. And, and, and you know, so how are we going to get them to be against everything at once? You know, it's kind of overwhelming. But I, I'm, I'm not saying I take that view. I'm just saying I think that a lot of advocates have got that feeling in their mind. Yes, they have that feeling in their mind because a lot of them have been have been have had that that feeling uh, or had that view 
uh, uh, presented to them time and time again by these large organizations that they have to they have to start small because people really aren't willing. I mean, it's the same thing. People aren't willing to talk about veganism, so you've got to talk to them about vegetarianism. And I think that that's nonsense. I think, look, why don't we deal with all of the people out there who can be educated? Um, because there are a lot of them that we're not reaching because we're 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 you know uh, trying to uh, uh, we're we're concerned about. Uh, whether we're not we're going to be appear to be too radical or whatever i again i can only speak to my experience but i talk about i mean i i just got back from spain talking about veganism for two days basically non-stop and and uh, every time someone wanted to talk about single issue campaigning uh, i would get us back to veganism and and i got an email from the organizer of the conference who said you know there are going to be a lot more new vegans here as a result of this discussion that you had and the fact that you did deal with the tough questions and you did answer answer the tough questions so i do think that we shouldn't be afraid of of the ideology of liberation, the ideology of, exp of of abolition, we shouldn't be afraid of that. But but we're 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 going to be going on too long, and I want to, I want to go into a topic that Ronnie raised um, in an email with me because I think it's extremely important, and I want him to address it. And that is, um, his views about the internet, positive, negative. How has the internet changed? Uh, what those of us who are concerned about animals are doing and can do, Ronnie? What do you think? Well, I think in many ways it's been a it's been a positive thing because it's a way that uh, uh, information can be exchanged. It's a way that the public can access information. They can um, access websites of um, animal protection organisations. Um, you know, organisations promoting veganism. Um, you can refer people to, to those websites. They can learn a hell of a lot from that. Um, in, as I said, in communication and organisation between ourselves. Um, once again, um, um, a very positive thing, a good way of keeping in touch. So in, in a lot of ways, it's been um, something very positive. But I think there's also a negative aspect, and that is that I, I think it's extremely important to interface with the public to get that out there on the street. If we're going to educate people, we've, Absolutely. we've got to mix with the public. We've got to be where the public is, you know. Um, um, uh, we, we've got to do street stalls. We've got to um, actually in, in, engage with ordinary people. And I think one of the problems that's been created by the internet is, is that, that uh, it's, it's turned a lot of people into kind of armchair campaigners where basically they think that you can kind of just send emails around about things to each other uh, and that, that, that somehow changes things. I, I think there's always been a problem um, within um, the animal rights movement of distinguishing between what actually is effective, what actually changes things uh, and, and what is basically just, just a load of hot air. It, 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 in fact, it, it, it's the kind of... <laughs> I know we're, we're, we're all having a discussion now, but I think um, it, if, um, if animals could be liberated by people talking about animal liberation, then they'd have long ago been liberated. If animals could be liberated by um, animal rights people, you know, watching programmes, watching films about animal exploitation... Um, discussing it with each other, then once again they'd long ago have been liberated. Um, because really, it's engagement with the public that, that changes things, not um, not so much engagement. I mean, I appreciate there has to be engagement between ourselves to decide things and discuss things. But I think what's happened with the internet is, is that that's that's kind of um, it increased that side of it. So it's become detrimental. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm on a number of email lists and there's, there's one particular one I'm on and, and I know Roger's on it as well. And there's a huge discussion going on at the moment um, about, um, I think there's a number of discussions going on um, where, um, you know, people are arguing about different things. And they're spending all their time engaged in this debate and it's something I've tried, you know, tried very hard to stay out of because... Um, what, what happens is people kind of focus on that and uh, rather than on getting out and educating people 
Um, yeah, well, I, I'd agree with that, and I've, I've kept yeah. out of that particular uh, conversation, as you've probably seen, R- Ronnie. But uh, of course, you know, you've also got got to acknowledge that the, the public are also on the internet. They're they're the ones that access the internet, and so rather than thinking in terms of uh, of a forum where just campaigners talk to each, each other, which has got an educational value within, within itself, so long as it, that's limited, I agree with that. But, you know, in some sense, if you go, if you go to something like, I, I, I'm on something called the forum site, which, which is which is a public site, but there's an animal rights thread to it. And if you go on that, you can actually have extended conversations with people in the same way as you could uh, at a street stall. So I don't actually see that there's a problem there. I mean, I do, I do see there's a negative aspect in, in, in the sense that, you know, people can then end up, you know, just talk, talking to, to two or three, three people, um, you know, on, on, on a little uh, forum and they, they might just be, be campaigners that they, that, that they're talking, you, you know, with one another, as, as it were, but you can actually talk, engage with, with the public on the internet as well as on the street. So there, there is that thing to, to, to take into account as well. Yeah, I I, I, agree, I tend to agree with uh, um, well, I mean, I agree with with what you both said. I mean, I, I agree with Ronnie that personal interaction is extremely important. But I agree with Roger that that one can achieve some level of personal interaction on the internet. I mean, for example, I do quite a bit of um, of lecturing where I don't actually go physically to the place, but I have a, 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 a you know I'll I'll sit in a a room at the university that has a monitor and uh, you know an internet hookup, a high quality, you know, high speed internet hookup, and I can give a lecture to a large number of people and have a discussion with a large number of people. So I am having in in foreign countries, so that I, I don't actually have to to, to travel there. So it's actually a somewhat greener way of of doing things, and that that's made possible by the internet. I also think that one can reach a lot of people on the internet one can do a lot of education on the internet um, and 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 I, I i i think that um one of the most important contributions that it's made um is that it's it's allowed us to communicate and to develop a great i mean before the internet in order for people who are concerned about animals to communicate with each other, they really largely had to do it through these organizations. And these organizations were really uh, gatekeeper organizations. If they did not want your message uh, to be uh, shared with their members, they could effectively keep you out by not inviting you to their conferences or not promoting your work in their magazines or, or, or whatever. So, so um, you know, they, they really did have a, a, a real censorship ability. And now I think with the internet, opportunity costs of of communication have dropped dramatically so that we can communicate with people all over the world and we can identify people who have similar views so that we can help them. I mean, one of the things that I do a great deal of is is I, I interact with groups of grassroots activists in different countries, giving them ideas uh, about things that they can do to promote nonviolent vegan education. I was just having a discussion several hours ago with uh, with someone in Spain um, who was, uh, we were talking about how um, setting up a, 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 a booth or a, a table at a local market uh, uh, on a Sunday and distributing vegan food and distributing literature about veganism uh, and by and again by veganism I don't just mean vegan diet I mean you know no eating them no wearing them no using them but basically uh, uh, talking with folks about how they can uh, effectively interface with with people in a in a physical way in their own communities and I think one of the most important things that we can do um, is is by using the internet we can educate people about how to deal with these issues in simple straightforward ways because I think that uh, y- you know um, uh, Roger you said before that people want to be political well you know we both see the problems with that because uh, we we end up presenting things in a in a somewhat uh, chaotic unconnected and, and occasionally incoherent way but a- advocates really do need to be educated about simple ways of presenting what in the end are simple ideas. I mean, I can have a conversation with people in which I can explain all sorts of Kantian philosophy and Kantian views about rights and never mention Immanuel Kant and never get into the jargony 
uh, business of, of, of philosophy, but yet explain the ideas about why it's morally wrong uh, to treat animals exclusively as means to our ends and why that's like slavery and why we think slavery is wrong and, so, and, 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 and why animal exploitation is analogous to slavery. Although so, I, I, do, I do think there's a terrible flaw in your work, Gary, in the sense that you, you don't mention hegemony uh, half as much <laughs> as you should. <laughs> yes, I've been criticized. I've been criticized for not talking about hegemony. But anyway, um, f- finish up comes, and I don't, I don't, um, I don't see this as our uh, our our final discussion. Um, I think we have a lot to talk about. But um, this is um, this is a long podcast now, and I want people to uh, not lose it, not 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 uh, lose their attention span. So I lose the way to live. <laughs> yeah, and, and exactly, and the will to live. So, fa- uh, so, 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 if there are concluding comments, uh, let us have them, and then we will end this one, and we'll do another one in the future. Ronnie, well, I just say it's 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 been great to take part, and um, as you say, I think I think there's, that there are other issues that need to be discussed. I mean, I mean, one one thing I think is is going perhaps more into. Um, what is the, the 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 best way to go about educating people in in in, in practical terms? Um, I, I I think that um, the, the, in many ways the movement's not thorough enough in, uh, in in what we do in terms of trying to get the message across to the public, and maybe that's something that can be discussed um, more in a future podcast. Yes, I, I I would agree with you, Ronnie, and I hope that you will do that because um, that we that we can do that together because I think that there are a lot of folks out there who really would like ideas because they what they get when they go to the large organizations is basically um, uh, however it's presented it's take our message and promote our organization and get people to support our organization and and um, and I think that there do need to be independent voices out there uh, trying to help advocates figure out ways of educating people in a coherent way uh, and um, and uh, you know so I agree with you Roger what do you parting parting thoughts uh, I think I'd probably emphasize uh, something that you mentioned before, which is the notion of the zero-sum game, Gary. And um, that means that we do need to kind of just kind of, you know, uh, sit, sit down and have a good kind of talk to ourselves uh, now, now and again and work out, you know, where should our priorities lie? Um, you know, I, I've had the experience myself uh, of, of almost like fe- feeling like a ball in a pinball machine, you know, kind of bouncing around from this campaign to to, a, to another, and then then looking back now, you know, um, you, you, I tend to think, well, you know, would I have done that, you know? And uh, you know, I, I mean, I don't really want to come over as some kind of you know parent try, trying to to get their children not to make the mistakes that I've made, but you know, it, it would be quite good. In fact, I, I argued um, in a journal article uh, several years ago, uncaged uh, journal article, uh, about the notion of every social movement needs to have a strategic audit every now and again. And I think I agree with Ronnie that that we as a movement have not been good at that. Uh, we've not not been good at that because. I think that you know a lot of people have got a lot of ego um, tied up in, in the campaigns that they themselves have launched, uh, you know that they, they themselves are involved in, and um, to, to some to some degree, um, you know you've, you've got to be kind of big person to actually say, yeah, I think I was wrong there, and you know that that wasn't a pretty smart move, and we we, we, we shouldn't do we you know we shouldn't have done that, and we shouldn't do it again, and uh, you know. And I think if we if we were big enough for, uh, as a movement to do that, I think we could move forward substantially because then we 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 could focus our priorities where they needed. In, 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 and in, in terms of what I would argue that uh, focus should be at the moment is, is on cultural change because um, you, you're quite right. Cultural change is necessary because. The other changes that that we're, that we're looking for in terms of legislation uh, or whatever will follow that. You know, politicians follow change; they don't make it themselves. You know, politicians are followers and not leaders. And so we we need to to, to um, alter the norms and values of society if we can. And of course, that does raise that issue, uh, which I think we touched on a little bit. I, d- I don't want to develop that now because it, it, it's 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 too. You know, it'd be too complicated. But you know, I do, I do think there's a kind of lack of confidence with many animal advocates in in terms of what they feel they can achieve, and I think that's why they scale down because they don't actually think 
that we can get animal liberation. You know, I, I, I've been told that many, many times by many, many different advocates. Well, we, we're never going to get what we want, so we're going to have to scale down and just get what we can. You know, and that means then we focus on the winnable. I, I, you know, I tend to think we've got to be a bit smarter than that. Well, and my final comment would follow on from that, and that is that um, pursuing the winnable is useless. We're going to be uh, pursuing the same campaigns that we've been camp- that we've been pursuing for decades now. Change never really will occur unless we really see this uh, as a, a big picture sort of issue. Uh, and I I think that. Um, we need, I agree with you completely, Roger, that we need to have, uh, advocates need to have confidence. They need to recognize they don't need large organizations and they don't need leaders. If this is ever going to work, if we are ever going to see any real significant social change, each of us has to become a leader in her or his own way. Uh, we don't need leaders. We need to educate ourselves about the arguments so that we can discuss things with people. Uh, we should always try to be non-judgmental and non-violent in our educational approaches, um, and and um, and we ought to see this as all part of you know our our, our efforts for animals as all part of of. Um, uh, uh, a common problem, a, re, a, a reaction against violence. Racism, sexism, heterosexism are all forms of violence, and so is speciesism. And um, and again, I, I'll go back to an idea that I started off with, that, that the animal rights movement, at least as I see it, the abolitionist approach, certainly as I've developed it, is an extension of the peace movement, uh, and that it focuses very, very much on, you know, not, that violence really isn't the answer. If the history of humankind is the history of violence, Violence. If violence worked, we would all be living in utopia right now, and we're not living in utopia. We're living in a society that's actually more violent than it's ever been. But in any event, people, thank you for listening. If you're not vegan, please go vegan. It's incredibly, incredibly easy to do. It is better for your physical health. Animal products are terrible for you. Animal agriculture is destroying the environment. It's an ecological disaster. But most importantly, most, most, most importantly, it's the morally right thing to do. So, please, if you're not vegan, go vegan. And I hope you will join us when we do podcast number 18, which I hope will be in the not-too-distant future. People have been writing, asking me about when the new book is coming out. The new book is called uh, The Animal Rights Debate, Abolition or Regulation. It's being published by Columbia University Press. And in the book, I will be debating Professor Robert Garner from the University of Leicester in the United Kingdom. And he takes the position that... um, we can continue to use animals as long as we improve uh, their treatment. I take the position that he's wrong. And so uh, the book will be out probably in another, uh, should be out by July, the beginning of July. And I hope that it will spark some debate and uh, and that uh, it will give people two very different perspectives to um, to, uh, to to to. Uh, 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 think about. Anyway, Ronnie Lee, thank you so much for joining us today uh, and for explaining your position, which I think um, uh, is a great deal more subtle than many people have assumed it to be. And Roger Yates, again, always a pleasure to to talk with you. I want to thank you both very much for your time and uh, and for sharing your thoughts with us. Okay, thank you very much uh, and uh, and thank you all for listening. Bye-bye.